Um, I want to thank everyone um, for attending today. And thanks, Venetia, for um, organizing all of this. And thank you, everyone, for attending. So on behalf of Sharon and I, I'd like to thank everyone. So in December 2020, the over 800 page book here, Our Whole Gwich and Way of Life Has Changed by myself and the Gwich and Tribal Council was published by the University of Alberta Press. Um, I'm Leslie McCartney. I'm the curator of oral history at the University of Alaska, but um, I have been working on this for a long time. And Sharon today is co-presenting with me and she's the director of heritage and culture at the Gwich and Tribal Council. So today, Sharon and I are going to tell you how we came to this project, what the process was, what the challenges were, and how we overcame them in taking the oral histories and constructing the life stories from 23 Gwich'in elders in the Northwest Territories in Canada and putting them into the book. This presentation is partially based on the introduction and the appendix in the book, and we also use much of the information um, that we're going to present today in an article that Ingrid Fritsch, Sharon, and I have written that will be published this autumn in the Oral History Journal. So many thanks to Ingrid for her contributions to this presentation too. So our presentation today is divided into four parts with the background, the interviews, converting the spoken words to written or writing the stories and authorship and sharing out. And Sharon's going to begin with a brief history of how this project came to be. Sharon? Good morning. Um, I'm just going to talk about the land claim and the Gwich'in settlement map. Um, the Gwich'in Comprehensive Land Claim Agreement was signed in 1992 between the government of Canada and Gwich'in as represented by the Gwich'in Tribal Council. <clears throat> this created the Gwich'in Settlement Region in the Northwest Territories. This is the location in Canada of where the Tetlit and Gwich'a Gwich'in live. Once the land claim was signed, the GTC was charged with implementing it so the GTC formed several organizations to deal with the responsibilities created under the land claim. The Gwich'in Social and Cultural Institute, GSCI, as founded as the cultural and heritage arm of the GTC in response to Gwich'in concerns about the decline of Gwich'in culture and language. The G GTC also directed the GSCI to fulfill the heritage resource responsibilities set out under, under the land claim. Just to name a few, this included providing a record of Gwich'in use and occupancy of the settlement region through time by way of place names, archeological and historical places and sites. The GSCI began operations in the autumn of 1993 the GSCI staff and board, made up of elders from all the four Gwich'in communities, then worked to identify projects for the GSCI to undertake with the mandate. GSCI mandate to document, preserve, and promote the practice of Gwich'in culture, language, traditional knowledge, and values. Uh, from the beginning, the GSCI conducted uh, community-driven, community-centered research based on the advice from the Gwich'in elders and the larger com Gwich'in community. The research was meant to benefit the Gwich'in elders and communities, as well as serve other public and scholarly purposes. And you could just see on the, on the um, presentation of outlining the, um, the framework. Um, the GSCI published their five-year strategic plan for 1996 to 2001 into the next mammalium. The plan outlined it, projects we carried out and we had carried out and detailed those ones we wanted to do in the future, like the biographies of prominent elders. The elders felt their stories were no longer being orally handed down to the next generation. So by recording them and writing them, their stories would help the next generation foster a sense of which an identity and pride. The project was described as follows. And here's, on the, 
which is on the slide. Thanks, Sharon. So in 1998, I was a mother of three. I was a farmer and an anthropology graduate student at Trent University in Peterborough in Ontario, Canada. I'd started my master's degree, but I was undecided about what topic to explore. But after attending a Trent University anthropology colloquium with a guest speaker of Thomas D. Andrews, who was the territorial archeologist in the Northwest Territories, my thesis work became clearer. Andrew's presentation described a multi-year project about the Eda Trail in which he and Kitchell elders had been working on. In the 90s, Andrews had traveled the Eda Trail from Great Slave Lake to Great Bear Lake in the Great Northwest Territories with several Kitchell elders and youth. The goal was to record archeological sites and their histories along with, along with traditional canoe route using oral histories of elders and their traveling party to understand the land use, pre-contact sites and any surface remains like birch bark canoes, grave sites or campsites. I was fascinated with Andrew's presentation and thought, now that's something I would like to do. So later when speaking with my supervisor, Julia, Professor Julia Harrison, we were discussing Andrew's project and she handed me the booklet that Andrews had given her, courtesy of his wife, Ingrid Critch, who at the time was the executive director of the GSCI. And sure enough, this booklet was the GSCI's strategic five-year plan into the next millennium. And the Elders Biography Project caught my eye. Professor Harrison suggested I contact Ingrid to see if uh, this could be the direction of my master's thesis. And she replied by saying, you haven't started that project yet, but if you're interested, you're welcome to be the lead researcher on it. I was thrilled and I started to read everything I could about the Gwich'in from early anthropologists and started to apply for funding at Trent University to visit the Gwich'in communities the next summer. In the summer of 1999, I met with Tom and Ingrid in Yellowknife. Ingrid had been working with the GSCI as the founding executive director since 1993, along with Alice Andre, which a Gwich'in woman from Chick, who was also the cultural director. Ingrid had now, since then, Ingrid had become the research director and she was mentoring Alice Dean to take on the executive director position. By the time I met with Ingrid and Alice Dean, the GSCI board of directors had directed the Institute to carry out an impressive array of research projects, many of which recorded, included recording and using oral history and traditional knowledge to understand document which in culture, land use through place names, ethnoarchaeology, genealogic, genealogical and ethnobotanical research. The summer I met them, Ingrid and Alice Dean had been working with another researcher, Michael Heine, to finalize and publish their first book, and it was self-published, Which of Which and Who Gone Up. The book included short biographies of elders who contributed the knowledge and oral histories, each being about a page or two in length. After leaving Yellowknife, I went to Inuvik, Sigi Chick, and Fort McPherson to meet the elders. The first purpose of the trip was twofold. First, to see if I was actually interested in the project, and secondly, what the project might entail. So to see that I was interested in the work, uh, I conducted preliminary interviews with Alice Dean's um, father, Hyacinth Andre, the third picture here. He was 89 years of age at the time, to just, and I just wanted to get a sense of what would be involved. I was interested in doing the work, and I told the GSCI and others I could begin interviewing elders in the summer of 2000. Sharon? <clears throat> the GSCI was delighted. Leslie was interested. We all... We all started applying to numerous sources to fund the project and the GSCI provided letters of support for Leslie to access student grants and awards. These letters of support from indigenous organizations to students are crucial for everyone. And we can talk about why that is in the question and answer after this presentation, but they help ensure the transparency of partner research. Leslie. Thank you, Sharon. So we're going to go on now to, um, my slides aren't working here. There we go, the interviews. So in the summer of 2000, two of my children and I moved to Seagate Chick. We had a workshop over several days with elders in Seagate Chick to discuss the project and seek their advice about several things. How were the stories to be recorded? Several elders suggest just writing them down, just write down what was said during the interview. But this presented three problems. It's difficult to give one's full undivided attention to a narrator while writing down what was said. No one can write fast enough to capture what was being said, and no one in the region was lit enough and skilled in which in orthography to write everything down. Most of the elders were uncomfortable with video recording. In their previous work with the GSCI, audit elders had been audio recorded and they were used to this. So the elders in the team decided on using cassette recorders. This was pre-digital. Best practices in oral history state that interviews should be conducted in the language interviewees are most comfortable in. We asked the elders what language should they be interviewed in. 
English, Gwich'in, or a mixture of both. If they chose Gwich'in, then a translator would be needed because I did not speak the language. There was no consensus. Some elders wished to be interviewed only in English, saying they did not want their words to be misconstrued through a translator. Some opted only to speak Gwich'in uh, when they were talking about their life on the land. Um, because they said there was no English, did not possess the, the proper appropriate words to describe this way of Gwich'in life, but they wanted to speak English when they discussed, discussed town life because there was limited Gwich'in words to describe those experiences. So when should translation occur during or after the interviews? The, inter the elders decided that if the narrator spoke in Gwich'in, they should be interviewed without interruption by the interviewer or translator. While this certainly presented problems for me, I knew that sometimes the narrator's stories were very long and they required listeners' patience and interrupting to translate each sentence or phrase on the spot into English was not only disrespectful, respectful, but it would have interrupted the concentration and flow of the narrator of the story. So I realized we'd need to wait until the translations were completed after the interviews, a process that could take months or longer before I could understand what was being said during the interview. And then I would have to follow up with the interviews on finer details of the stories. Although not ideal, this is one of the practicalities of doing this type of work. Sharon? The elders were asked about what type of questions should be asked. In order to identify both themes and knowledge, they wanted to pass on to the next generation, as well as what the community would find of interest. The following was the result. There's questions up on the slide of what was asked. The questions were just a guide. It became clear during the workshop that the elders wanted this project to fulfill several objectives. In order to help with the GSCI place names research, they wanted to include the place names of where they were born, where they had, where they had traveled on the land, and maybe stories about those places. The elders felt that they were the last generation to live and travel on the land and the younger people were not learning about these places. They also wanted more gene genealogical information recorded about the interviewees since the elders were concerned that many younger people did not, did not know their family history. I had previously worked on a large genealogy project in Fort McPherson. And so the elders wanted to contribute details that would help this project believing it would also help the GTC with their collection of family information for enrollment purposes. During the workshop, the elders stressed the importance of education, not just formal in school, which many did not attend, but the type of education and lessons learned from family and elders. They felt that this latter type of knowledge was not being passed down to the next generation. They also hoped that their stories would give the next generation a sense of pride, identity, and knowledge of their culture and history. Leslie? Sorry. Thank you, Sharon. Sorry there. So during these initial meetings, these specific elders suggested other elders that should be interviewed. And the list quickly grew to about 20. I estimated that with the amount of information the elders wanted collected, the resulting stories were going to be a little longer than the elders' biographies included in the Gwich'i Gwich'i Rugon Duck, but I felt it was still possible given the length of the project and its funding. So we needed to, uh, we needed to determine best practices for the oral history and recording and preservation of the recordings. The interviews were to be recorded on cassettes. We wanted high quality, technically sound recordings and accurate transcripts and translations of the Gwich'in oral tradition for archival purposes and for preservation. We needed a translator, someone fluent in English and Gwich'in. This was a challenge as the Gwich'in language is one of the most endangered indigenous languages in the Northwest Territories with fluent speakers mostly over the age of 60. The Gwich'in Language Center had been in operation for many years under the management of the government and the NWT. In 2000, the GTC turned the responsibility of the Language Center over to the GSCI. And the mandate of the Language Center at the time was to carry out language research and language revitalization projects in according with the G GSCI's five-year plan. At the time, a new Gwich'in language manager had just been hired, but he had far too much to do in his new job to take on being a translator in this project. Another possibility was Marie Therese, who we knew both Paul Terry, Remy Sawyer, whom I'd met the previous summer in 1999. 
She was a glitchy glitchy woman who returned home to seek a check from Edmonton most summers to stay with her daughter and grandchildren. When Ashley talked to Terry about being interviewed as part of the project, she'd refused because she was writing her own book about her life. She was also very distrustful of initially of working with a non-Indigenous Southerner. I spent many hours speaking with Terry about writing approaches she was taking in writing her own life stories, as well as the approaches I was contemplating for the biographies project. Terry had her own ideas about what should be captured in the interviews, as many of the elders were relations of hers. Like, and um, like the elders, she was saddened by how much witch and identity and pride through the stories was not being captured and passed down next, to the next generation. So she was fiercely passionate about her culture and language and wanted to make sure that her elders were protected. Terry and I came to understand and respect each other's work approach, realizing we both had the same goal in mind, to document the life stories of witch and elders in the witch and elders' own words and with the utmost respect. After these conversations, I had a broader awareness of how insiders felt about outsiders coming into the community, doing work, and then neither giving back or possibly misrepresenting community members. Confident I would honor her promises to respect the words of the elders and to honor their stories, to complete the project, to ensure that the community saw a final project from the project from the work, Terry finally agreed to act as the interviewer and translator. And I've just lost my spot and I apologize for that. Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> while, the, while the good good language in dialect was Terry's Sawyer's first language, she was also fluent in the spoken English. She said many times throughout the course of the project that this was one of the ways in which she could help teach future generations about their ancestors and culture. She knew almost all of the elders that were going to be interviewed for the project and assisted in interviewing several of them. She was fiercely passionate about people's stories not being changed. She repeatedly told the elders interviewed that she, the GSCI and Leslie would honor their stories completely and they could trust Leslie to do what, what she said she would do. Thanks, Sharon. So in the summers between 1999 and 2001, we collected the oral history life stories of 23 elders. Terry acted as the translator and in, 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 in several interviews, as well as Annie B. Gordon and Aklavik. Other interviews were conducted solely by myself in English. Several elders were interviewed over multiple sessions, some in their homes, some at fish camps, some in the long-term care facility in Inuvik. Sarah Simon was the oldest elder interviewed. She was born in 1901 and was 99 years of age when I first interviewed her. The youngest narrator for the project was Caroline Andre. She was born in 1935 and was 66 years of age when interviewed. The elder stories are more than personal recollections about their lives. Many of them are like travel logs with personal narratives full of place names and stories about those place names. Woven through the elder stories are threads of their traditional knowledge and the unique style of their oral tradition, songs, prayers, and ancient tales such as Atachukai, one of the legendary Gwich'in travelers who lived his life during the Sikh day, day, days when animals and people were equals who could speak to one another and take on each other's form. The oldest elders sang songs in the old Gwich'in language and recounted how the old tea dance was done. All of the stories shared and incorporated Gwich'in values of respect, honor, love, kindness, honesty, fairness, sharing, caring, the tales of song and dance, laughter, humor, teaching, and spirituality. Just as importantly, they spoke to fundamental Gwich'in principles of Gwich'in culture, such as crucial roles that elders play as teachers of traditional knowledge, history, and language, and culture. A way of life based on a special spiritual relationship between the Gwich'in and the land, and the preservation of and respect for the land, which is essential to the well being and subsistence lifestyle of the Gwich'in people and their culture. The importance of family history, the significance of keeping culture alive and creating cross cultural understanding between Gwich'in and non Gwich'in to build a new respect and understanding in today's global economy. Along with this work, I also kept daily field notes. Each evening, I would spend a long time detailing what had happened that day in the community, my thoughts and reactions and interactions with people outside the interview, creating a history of the experience of the project so that it was also meant to complement my master's degree research. So converting the spoken words into the written words or writing the stories is our next part. Converting the spoken word in spoken word in the written word is a very complicated process and I found myself coming back to this quote time and time again throughout the 20 years that I worked on this project. 
And I'll just let you realize, read that. As I worked with the interview material, interview material to build the stories, um, a process called writing the stories, each time I encountered a Gwich'in word or place name, I found that the simple translation of the word into English without the cultural context or background behind it distorted the very message that the elders were trying to tell. For example, when Simon, uh, Sarah Simon talked about a place named Shilby in her story, I realized that if I simply wrote the elders' stories for other elders to read, all the elders would immediately understand what the name meant. That is, they would know the broader significance of the name, and it would not just be a name written on a page. But writing for that audience was only one of the project goals. If younger Gwich'in or non-Gwich'in people read the stories, they would have no idea or how to even understand Shilby it, as a mere word-for-word -word translation. It did not explain the layered historical and cultural meaning of that place name. Then how to best convey the context of the Gwich'in words and stories that surrounded them for the multiple audiences simultaneously to ensure that the embedded cultural knowledge was not lost. So the questions we had to ask ourselves at the outset was who ultimately was going to read this book? And secondly, how should I write the stories to speak to that audience or audiences? Before we began collecting the stories, the GSCI and very community members felt that the stories could be written into one large book or divided into smaller books, each devoted to an elder that would be used in the Gwich'in schools to help children learn about their heritage and culture. But as soon as the collection of the stories began, the richness of the stories revealed that they could speak to a much wider audience, including academics, the general public interested in Canada's history, the North, its Indigenous people, educators of all levels, and Gwich'in and non-Gwich'in readers worldwide, who may or may not have had any prior knowledge of Gwich'in history or culture. Ultimately, these were the audiences for whom we needed to write the stories. And so imagining the intended readers shaped the decisions that we made on how to reach such broad and diverse audiences. Sharon? Um, <clears throat> a number of local people were hired to transcribe the interviews conducted in English. Since the core of the GSCI school was to impart elders knowledge to younger generation, Many of the GSAI projects included local youth and young adults when, whenever possible. We hired those who showed an interest in their work and were keen to, new, to learn new skills. Having them learn how to transcribe their recordings not only gave them work experience and helped build useful skills, but also, as the GSCI hoped, provided them with the opportunity to learn more about their cultural and history. In addition to these team members, Leslie also transcribed many of the interviews conducted in English and many of the translated interviews. Following best practice in oral history, Leslie created a transcript template for transcribers to use, which ensured uniformity of the transcripts and of the, made, the metadata recorded directly into them. Whether the transcript, oh, sorry, thanks Sharon. Whether the interviews were done in English or Gwich'in, I knew from the outset the decisions about transcript strategies and standardizations for consistency needed to be made before trying to put the spoken word on paper. It's beyond this presentation scope to offer complete literature review and analysis of the evolution of transcription. But here's a snapshot of the literature we used to understand and how and why certain decisions were made for the project. I knew that transcribing oral history interviews or conveying the narrator's word into a textual form on a page was a very tricky task. Willa Baum's book, Transcribing and Editing Oral History, provided guidance on what to transcribe, what not to, how to transcribe, and general principles for editing, proofreading, and indexing. Her advice was to produce information as exact and complete as possible, goal creating usable research manuscript that was an accurate portrait of the narrator. Transcribers were to name the narrator's voice and words, avoid personal or social injury to the narrator and keep the list of names proper. Pelham Davis and, and others um, in their book, Oral History from Tape to Type, also provide guidance on transcribing, editing, finishing the transcript, stressing that only accurate verbatim transcription and addressing false starts and crutch words and how to edit more generally. I was very much of the argument put forth by uh, Alexander, oral historian Alessandro Cortelli um, about transcripts that he says are mutilated or perverted representations of a spoken word. Those who critique transcripts argue that they're only a faint copy of the original recording because they're prone to errors in editing, and they never really translate meanings or complexities of a spoken word. The oral recordings are the primary source, and the transcripts at best are flawed representations 
but despite these critiques, I knew we had to convert the oral into text for the purposes of writing a book. Since the transcripts were reconstructed stories for a predetermined audience, all we needed to have them as smooth and readable as possible. So with the GSCI's agreement, all the false starts and repetitious such as ums, ahs, yours, they were deleted from the transcripts. When transcribers encountered a place name or spelling that they didn't know how to do, we put it in squared brackets and said spelling needs to be verified for later revision and correction. And we used similar notation with people's names or other terms. When there was confusion about dates or kinships or sequence of events, it was also highlighted. And when we visited the narrators again, I took the time to review these points and correct the transcripts. I did consider spelling each which and word out individually, placing a little of translation under it, then putting a sentence into a gloss of readable index. But this was a luxury that we could not afford. There was no one available in the Gwich'in settlement region who had the skill to do this, and there were no funds to hire a skilled linguist to do such. Moreover, given the number of interviews, this undertaking would have been a monumental task and well beyond the scope of the project. Although this was a strategy that would have been optimal and one that I would have liked the best, it was not employed for these reasons. The transcripts produced in this project were verified by spot listening or having a second person listen to the recordings to make any corrections. But how do you translate in a way that maintains the fidelity to the narrator's words and the intent behind those words? I also had to develop a process for handling the translations of the which into English. After considering many options for translating, in the end, the most workable solution was to give Terry two tape recorders. She played back the interview on the first tape recorder for a minute or two, and then would record her translation into English of what had been said into a second recorder. This was long and difficult and painstaking work, and it took her hours and hours to complete. Terry often produced two or three translation variations of what the narrator said, or inserted within the translation an explanation of what the narrator was talking about. In other words, she put the story into cultural context. So she would translate, that is say the Gwich'in words into English being literate. She would interpret them, which is different. It's an attempt to find the meaning of what's being said, or she would elaborate on them, which is to educate the audience about, or me who was listening to the tapes, what was actually being said. So here's just two examples of what uh, Terry would do and note that she would say note, and then this, she would give the explanation or the elaboration of what was being said. Terry would often but always indicate verbally that she was adding her own elaborations of what was being said. So there are points in the transcripts when the distinction between what the elder said and what Terry's elaboration of the elder said were not clear, and no one on the team realized this at the time. The translation and interpreted recordings from English to, or from Gwich into English were transcribed using the same conventions for the English own. But this still left us with how to represent the oral on the page. Transcripts and tr translations are only two complement. Uh, components of the language representation I had to consider. There's vernacular English is also a significant con consideration when transcribing interviews. The English the elders spoke is not, does not always conform to standard English. So I was faced with the question of whether to fix the English, inserting words that weren't actually spoken to mitigate assumptions about native speakers based on language use. During the 1980s, there was emerging critiques in Western way of thinking about conveying ind indigenous languages and oral history on the page. Writers, ethnographers, linguists, anthropologists, and scholars such as Dennis Tedlock, Del Himes, Brian Swan, Arnold Kruppat, H. David Brumble III, and Anthony Mattina, just to name a few, devised new methods for transcription and translation of Native North American oral history, poetry, performance, and song into written text. Salish linguist Anthony Mattina noted that the narratives on the printed page are like museum artifacts. The understanding that one gets from looking at an artifact in a museum or reading a narrative is directly proportionate to what the viewer or reader knows about the traditions and context of the text. In his work based with the uh, Colville Okanagan elder Peter Seymour's translation of the Golden Woman stories, Matina encountered many of the same issues that I did in preparing the book. Matina's transcribed the recordings and then worked with Madeline, Mary Madeline de Soudal to translate them into English. And De Soudal spoke a dialect of English that Matina called, I'm going to use some politically incorrect terms here, but this is how they are referred to in the literature. He referred to it as Red English, which he defrayed as a pan-Indian phenomenon of various sub-dialects. Matina acknowledged that some scholars objected to this style of dialect in print because they believed that lay readers may have seen this dialect as inferior English or one that portrayed the speakers as impoverished, leading to a perpetuation of stereotypes of Indigenous people. And Matina disagreed. He said the problem is not with the speaker or the dialect, the problem is with the reader who makes judgments about speakers based on their speech patterns. 
Mattia believed that educating the audience about the dialect spoken was crucial, and he encouraged readers not to judge people by how they thought others should talk. So in constructing the elders' stories, I tried as much as possible to retain the way the elders spoke, bearing in mind that English is not their first language, and that some of the words on the page do in 2D conform to Medina's idea of a distinct dialect. So that CRCI and I needed to work together to find a compromise on how the voice of the elder was to be represented in writing. How could we represent the way they spoke, shown on the page, in a respectful way? We pointed out in the introduction of the book that the text of the stories were the builders' voices and did not always conform to perfect written English. For example, there's no pronoun for she and Gwichin, so everyone is he. So when Hyas and Andre spoke about his mother in one of the interviews, and I'll let you read this, he referred to his mother as he and him. One line of thinking was to clean up the speech to make it read like perfect English on the page. Some elders had expressed the, the way that made them look on the page in their spoken language made them look uneducated. They did not want this. Others expressed with great passion that their words should not be changed on the page and left as spoken. Even though the elders in the GSCI and I did not agree initially on how to overcome this challenge, in the end we agreed on this particular instance to change him to her and he to she in the text when Hyacinth was discussing his mother so the reader would better understand who he was talking about. We are also keenly aware that we needed to avoid many other criticisms of the genre, and there's just too many to discuss here, but here's three. Brumble noted that Angle editors routinely cut out rep rep repetition because he said it grates on the modern ear, despite the fact that repetition is commonly a part of oral narrative. In writing the stories, I deliberately chose to leave many repetitions in. Here's an example from Annie Benoit's uh, story. Here's the transcript and here's the actual what ended up in the book. Although some repetitions were kept in, not all were, we purposely did not smooth out all the grammar in English to make it perfectly looking English on the page. Brumble also noticed that editors also arranged details in chronological order. It was a deliberate choice on my part not to present every story of the elders in the Western chronological style order. I was also careful not to evoke stereotypes of Indigenous people that appear much in previous literature. And in the end, in reconstructing the elders life stories, as author and oral historian Valerie Yell points out, biography is sometimes considered a literary genre as well as a historical one. In writing the stories, it was more than just presenting a transcript of what had been recorded during the interviews. To get a sense of the person, I had to bring together multiple sources of information to tell the elders stories. Now, many scholars caution that anyone using oral history should accurately and carefully identify its content and context. They advocate researchers should not only consider what's being said by whom, but for what purpose, but ensure that the audience knows the common and unique understandings and perspectives that's brought to each oral history interview, and that these should be respected and accurately presented. But there's still more to consider when reflecting on how to present oral history on the page. In discussing the issues of translating Indigenous languages into English, Carrie Dick, for example, or Dyke, for example, asked how effective translations and knowledge transfer um, in the, from the Iroquois language, for example, could be transmitted into the, into the medium of Iroquois language, sorry, from Iroquois culture. She knows that puns are lost when they're translated into English because Cayuga verbs are used to convey um, meaning, whereas English is used sentences. And she argues that some translations just do not convey without further explanation what a word meant. And sometimes translating and transcribing a Cayuga factual verb form is inadequate to convey the meaning in English. The same is true in Gwich'in. Hence the decision to educate, Terry's decision to educate anyone reading the Gwich'in elders transcript by elaborating on some of what the narrator said. And, and we had to include these elaborations in the stories. As I said, we didn't have the resource to spell out each individual Gwich'in word and place a translation under it and then do a gloss as much as I would have liked to. But I also recognize the translation had it been done this way, we would have lost a lot of rich material such as the cultural or historical context of place names, it would have been compromised or lost. So in keeping these perspectives in mind, as well as oral history ethics and best practice, how are we gonna reconstruct these stories for our intended audiences? Being cognizant of the fact that we promised the elders that their words would not be ill-represented or their meanings of the stories would be mis misconstrued. And there was another issue. Before and during the elders' reconstruction of the stories, I immersed myself in the literature and the genre of, again, politically incorrect today, but in the literature, Indian autobiography and Indian biography, or as Henri Krupat calls it, as told to autobiographies of Indians, as well as non-Indigenous writers' portrayals of Indigenous people. And I did find the work of Arnold Krupat 
H. David Brumble III, Francis, uh, Daniel Francis, and Ward Churchill, just to name four, are very influential. Who points out that Indian biographies are indeed written by whites, not by Indians of those who speak? This is true in this project. I am not, I am not indigenous. Ingrid, who played a huge role in reviewing and editing and clarifying many of the manuscripts over the years, is also non-Indigenous. She was elected an honorary Gwich'in member in 2008 in appreciation of her years of work with them and a testament to the trust they had in her. Being asked by an indigenous nonprofit organization to write elder stories for publication was and remains a great honor. And it also made me very, very, um, very, very uncomfortable. I was keenly aware of being yet another in a long list of non-Indigenous people who write the life stories of Indigenous people, and I tried very hard to overcome the criticisms of this dynamic. Kupat notes that Indian autobiographies are collaborative efforts jointly produced by a white who translates, transcribes, compiles, edits, interprets, and polishes, and ultimately um, determines the form of text writing, but it's the Indian who is the subject and whose life becomes the content of the autobiography. I acknowledge that this may be only partially true in this project, I believe that by working with the elders, Gwich'in translator, trusted Gwich'in staff from the GSCI, Sharon and, and um, Alice Dean Andre in particular, who reviewed and provided additional cultural information to edit the material over years that we address this criticism. In 2002, I started the storytelling process by reviewing the transcript and creating uh, for each elder the stories but in blocks in the thematic order as opposed to a Western chronology. This came a tricky dance of smoothing out the English to make it readable to broad audiences, but not taking away from the reader's voice, but retaining that Latina dialectic feel. And it took me several years to work out just how much smoothing of the English versions could be done without actually mis misrepresenting the elder's words. When I completed this, I was left with blocks of thematic stories, but they weren't tied together in any manner. I became the executive director of the GSCI in 2002, and this gave me more opportunities to spend time with the elders, but there was not enough time to work on the stories, and I really didn't know how to make the stories read better. For years, I agonized over how to represent the elders' stories with the knowledge about it, which in culture and language, um, and I kept redrafting the stories. And after I finished each draft, I would still be unsatisfied, feeling that the story was not the whole story. I kept reading, trying to find the answer on how to bring these stories together in a way that made sense for multiple audiences. Meanwhile, the years slipped away. In 2004, I moved to London, England to direct a large oral history project there. I continued to read and work on the stories, plus write my master's thesis, not on the topic I'd chosen about indigenous, indigenous biographies, but on one about Albert Johnson, a story that had surfaced in the interviews. With the London project finished in 2008, I moved to Dublin, Ireland to take a position at Trinity College. I continued to work on the stories, but I still remain very dissatisfied with the drafts. I even went back and forth on how, to, how the Gwich'in elders and their stories and the aims in the project and the culture and language, how can this be represented properly? Finally, in 2009, I decided the elder stories would be best ordered from oldest to youngest, from Sarah Simon, born in 1901, to Caroline Andre, born in 1935. I felt that placed in this order, the stories could be heard and read in several ways, as unique voices through Gwich'in history, and I tried to write each story differently so that the person, a personality of each elder would shine through and not be forced to conform into one narrative style. The stories also varied in length, the longest being Sarah Simons, Mary Kendi's, who were over 60 pages long, and the shortest being Sarah's Pod Plumes and Violet Jerome's and Ellen Vetropa's stories. They were only about 10 pages each. Some elders had more detailed stories than telling their stories, others had better memory recall, and some stories just needed more background information to set the context. That's the inconsistent lengths devoted to each elder in the book. So in the end, the elders' stories could be read in the order they appeared, although it's not essential to do so, or they could be viewed collectively as a testament to the social and cultural history of a generation of Gwich'in. But there was still something missing. I updated the introductory, uh, introduction I'd written in 2002 to give the reader a historical and uh, cultural context, but I still wasn't satisfied. It took me several year, years to determine there was three things that still needed to have done to have the book truly represent what the, uh, the way the elders felt it should be and to give more con. So one was to give more context about the elders' lives, give more genealogy information, and give the meanings about the place names. And it wasn't until 2009 when I was going over my field notes that I realized I had so much more information about the elders' lives that could be incorporated into the stories giving the readers an insight into their personality and more context. 
It took me about two years to pull all the information out of my field notes and decide how to use them in each elder story and craft a narrative that would actually tie all the blocks um, of stories together. Through this, I employed what Patricia Levy calls in her book, Oral History Understanding Qualitative Research, an impressionistic writing approach, wherein the researcher becomes the storyteller. And this approach helped me tell vivid, meaningful stories and allowed me to focus on the rich descriptions of the narrators and their stories, overall giving the book more texture and tone, I hope. The best use of this impressionistic writing is really a creative process. And I depended on my field notes and observations and experiences um, living in the communities with the elders uh, for inspiration. And I also relied very heavily on the, on the previously conducted research published and unpublished by the GSCI. My goal was to create narratives that tied the stories together to give the reader more intimate sense of each elder and a deeper understanding of the historical, social and family context of the elder stories. Although I still wasn't really totally satisfied with the results, I sent these again to the GSCI for comment. Sharon? Thank you, Liz. Um, this is when the GSCI noticed discrepancies between several of the original, original recordings and their translations. They decided that, uh, that all the original audio tapes, now in digital format, needed to, needed to be retranslated to, to try to bring clarity to the issues we noted above about Terry's translations interpretations. Funds were raised and over the following five years, the Quichin recordings were retranslated and or retranscribed and compared to the original work that Terry had done. The GSCI determined that Terry had indeed not always provided strict translations, embellishing, interpreting what she had heard. By this time, Terry had passed away, so we could not verify this with her, but the pattern fit. So in a number of cases, what Leslie and others on the project team read were Terry's interpretations, not the words of the elders. The GSCI sent Leslie the new transcripts. Leslie? So I was overwhelmed, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and how do you cope with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of transcripts that don't match? So I created tables and I actually had to go through line by line, hundreds and hundreds of pages of translations to see exactly where the problems were. And then we did discover what the problems were. Terry collaborated um, and not mentioned that she was doing it in places and this is what had happened. So what do we do? Without Terry's elaborations, the stories were just flat is what I call them. Yet we'd made promises not to misrepresent what the elders had said and put words into their mouths. So to address this complication, we decided to add a footnote at the beginning of each story, which indicated in the transcript that it would contain Terry's elaborations and go beyond what the elder had said in the original recording. Meanwhile, I moved to Fairbanks, Alaska to take up the current position and I had to review the stories again. And um, so this is, uh, I, so we read the stories again and I noticed that we had a huge gap of the genealogy. And this is where Sharon and her expertise comes in. In their interviews, the elders assume the listeners would know their family trees and kinship ties just as well as they did. But for readers of their stories, for many, that would be not, not be the case. It was during this time that Leslie rediscovered the Gwichin Enrollments Board's 1998 publication on her bookshelf. As I mentioned earlier, I had been involved in Fort McPherson in doing genealogy projects. The research done on Tatlet family trees resulted in the book, Jeju, Who Are My Grandparents? Amazing work by Sharon and team. So to assist the reader who could possibly not know all of the which, uh, elders' kinship and numerous uh, kinship ties, numerous footnotes were added to the manuscript to provide this background knowledge. I'm sorry, the scan's not great, but basically if you go down um, to the one, two, three, fifth line at the bottom, footnote number 53, she talks, um, she mentions John Firth and there's the footnote beside about John Firth, just to show you how extensive the footnotes had to be based on Sharon and team's uh, previous research and publication. But even after all these rewrites, I still felt something was missing. It was the place names. 
The place names and the stories were like pegs upon which stories were hung, but the pegs were empty and the stories behind the place names and their meaning were not in the embedded in the book or in the stories. And the Gwich'in relationship with the land and the environment is paramount in the elder stories. Travel on the land and trails and place names pepper their narratives. The historic and geographic environmental knowledge itself is actually embedded in the land. Place names are not just names, they represent connections between people and land and they reflect the names of topographical features and past events, historic and legendary. And place is central in the elder stories, but the importance and cultural context of the place names to which the elders referred in the stories was not explicit in the book and in the manuscript. The elders told their stories thinking the listener would know the names and places and know these meanings of specific place names. Sharon? The GSC, the GSCI had a dream for some time, and that was to create an interactive online place names and story atlas, where, oh, where our over 20 years of research on place names would be brought together and easily accessible to anyone. That dream finally came tr true in 2015, when we launched the online Gwich'in Place Names Atlas. The Atlas was a culmination of more than two decades of collaboration between the GSCI and the Gwich'in elders and traditional land users. And it contains over 900 place names along with their translation, a sound file to hear the name, associated oral history and traditional knowledge, plus photos and videos. With the Atlas, visitors can explore the cultural, culture, history, traditional knowledge and land use through the place names that blanket the land effectively turning the physical landscape into a cultural landscape. Thank you. This was finally the answer I was looking for to bring the life of the place names along with the stories and traditional knowledge associated with them for the readers of the book who might be unfamiliar with them. So in 2015, after the Atlas went live, I began the next round of manuscript writing by incorporating much of the information found in the Atlas into the story, elder stories in the form of footnotes. Readers are encouraged to read each chapter of the book in conjunction with the online Atlas to explore more fully the sense of place. For example, when Sarah Simon spoke of Shildi, when uh, in the earlier versions, this is what she basically said. She so said they were at a fish camp at a place called Shildi. People were fishing, there was women expecting them. No one understands what Shildi means. So without, the, uh, without knowing this, the story loses its important feature of the Gwich'in world and cosmology. So the solution was for us to put a footnote of each place name and reference it back to the corresponding ID number in the atlas. So now this is what the uh, footnote for Shildi reads. And um, people can then look online. It's one of the most sacred places in the Tadlak Gwich'in traditional land use area. They can look online now and find where it is hear the word and read more about it. Um, and I must say that as each time we read, we, we redid the manuscript, all the place, not all, but almost all the place names and spellings changed. So every time we updated the manuscript, spellings, place name spellings had to change. So I updated this again, uh, updated the introduction to the book and created an appendix to explain how the project was. And then it came the, the task of, um, Finding the publisher, Sharon. The final step was to publish the book. We had always self-published, but our, this, but this book was too big and too costly for us to do. Also, we thought that going through a publisher would result in a wider distribution. We had asked Leslie to find a publisher. So I'd never done this before, it was a new challenge. I see we're gonna run out of time. I'm gonna briefly condense this. We wanted a Canadian publisher. We approached the University of Alberta Press. Um, they had uh, published Indigenous Oral History before. They were interested, but asked who the author was. And we had really not even considered author. So at this point to have 23 authors, all of the elders, myself and the tribal council was not common in social sciencing and they weren't um, thrilled with that prospect. So in the end, it was decided that myself and GTC, which had now absorbed the GSCI would be the uh, authors. And we can talk to you more about um, the accuracies of that if you like. Um, we submitted the final manuscript in 2017. Again, all, everything had to be changed. It was all changed. It went out for peer review, came back in 2018. 
I incorporated all the uh, corrections and suggestions and then came the editing process, which took a long time Jim didn't share. And with Sharon, myself and Ingrid going through word by word, the entire manuscript again, updating place names, uh, spellings, name spellings. This is where Ingrid and Sharon's expertise was absolutely invaluable. And in 2018, they thought it would take about a year to publish. Um, Sharon, do you want me to briefly just do the next paragraph quickly? Yes, please. Okay. So it took a long time and then we finally learned that um, it was going to cost $50,000 to print. Um, the GSCI GTC wanted it printed but didn't have the money. I had already donated over 2,000 hours of my personal time to this and was did not have $50,000. So thanks to Sharon and uh, then Carolyn Lenny, operating officer at GTC, they juggled the budgets and found the money that we could actually get this printed. So the contract was signed and um, the printing, ha printing happened. And um, our only regret is that there's only one elder left alive today that's featured in the book. But I must say that the GSCI did print calendars back in 2001 and 2003 featuring the elders and their stories, which was a really big hit in the communities. And a lot of those um, pictures and narratives are framed in the band offices and, and the Nunavik hospital today. And just to talk about the motivation, um, we had, you know, it's been over 22 years. And so for the GSCI, um, they, all of their projects were, you know, based on dedication, respect, and to produce the best possible product given um, their skills and knowledge and honor the elders. And for me, um, my motivation was to live up to the promises that I had made. And especially with the ethics of the Oral History Society is that you do not make promises you cannot keep. And I promised Terry, the GSCI and the elders that this would be published eventually. I didn't think it would take 22 years, but it did. In the end, we hope all the decisions along the way has honored um, the elder stories and lives and words. And we hope that Gwich'in and non-Gwich'in readers will see this as the bridge between the cultures. Um, I was very touched, as I think Sharon was, that um, Jordan Peterson, who was then the Grand Deputy Chief of the Tribal Council, wrote the foreword to the book, and actually his great-grandmother is one of the people featured, one of the elders featured in the book, and he made me cry um, when he said that he would learn about his identity and, um, through these stories, and if he's done that, then we have basically achieved what the elders wanted to achieve. Sharon, do you have a couple of closing words about the positive response we've had in the community to the book? Um, when we published the book, the first book went to our um, Grand Chief, um, Kenny Kikavichik. Um, Kenny, Kenny said it's, it's such a treasure for our people. And Kenny's grandfather's featured in the book. His name is Peter Kay. And traditionally, their name is Kikavichik. Um, another person from Fort McPherson told me that, um, that he read the book in six days and really enjoyed reading the book. He just couldn't put it down. And another lady that came in wanted a copy of the book. She said, when my, when my grandsons are on the land, she said, they like taking this material out and reading, reading the materials that we produce. And um, another lady that I gave the book to that worked in the tribal office, she said, um, I've been reading a few different stories from our whole way of life has changed. And she said, I feel so blessed in learning more from their stories, each and every one of them. In just a few excerpts that I have read, learned some new places in the Gwich'in settlement area and learned a few te techniques of drying meat and fish. Love stories, the passion and passion of these elders have their way of life. I want to say thank you to the crew who made this book. It is truly a passionate guide to a healthy, healthy lifestyle we can still use. And when I gave her a copy of the book, she had tears in her eyes because she was so happy to get a copy. Thanks, Sharon. And I just want to end by saying there's no way that this book could have been written without all of the research that the GSCI and people like Sharon and Ingrid and Alice Dean have done in the previous years. This book was just basically another building block on top of building blocks of research that had already been done. So, um, Masi Cho, um, thank you very much. And um, any questions for Sharon or I? Uh, 
thank you so much. There are many questions, but we're out of time. So oh. could we have another session, just a question answer session? Yes, I'm happy to do that, Sharon, are you? I'm happy to stay on the line for a long, little longer too, if we need to. Uh, I think I'm, we... I'm happy to stay on the line too. Okay. Um, first is um, lots of appreciation from everyone uh, for Dr. McCartney and Ms. Sharon Snowshoot. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and in the words of Paul Thistel uh, in the chat, um, thank you, Mahasi Cho, to all who dedicated themselves to complete this marvelous product. Thank you so much. So I have received many questions and I'm going to just uh, read those questions. Um, how can you give the youth um, inspiration to this new virtual reality? I, I missed that. Sorry. How can you what? So give the youth. How can you How can you give the youth um, inspiration for this new virtual reality? Like you were showing us the atlas and so many place names and um, using digital literacy for oral history. Sharon, do you want to take that? Um, one of the things that I did when the book was going to be published was I approached the um, our regional Beaufort Delta Education Council. Um, they provided some of the funding for publishing this book, and um, I gave uh, I think I gave a hundred books to the schools in the region to put in the schools so that they could read the book. Um, I know that. Um, <clears throat> One teacher that teaches our language and cultural in the school, she came to me and said, I want my own book. She said, I know you gave the schools their, their books, but I want my own. She said, so they, they, they do use the um, information in the schools. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's really relevant. Uh, the next question is um, in uh, making this book, what was, is your favorite season on the land? Karen? Um, <clears throat> my favorite season on the land is um, going out to the fish camp and <clears throat> making dry fish. Um, one of the things about myself is that um, I'm a product of a residential school. I went to residential school all my life. And um, I think one of the things about Going to residential school is, um, I think you have to like relearn all your skills. Um, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do is re relearn um, to do things traditionally. I enjoy berry picking in the summer. <laughs> yeah, like right now it's um, time to pick berries. So that's one of the things I like to do too, is to store berries for the, for the winter. What were the challenges you found um, when you were um, uh, interviewing the elders? Um, one of the big challenges was trying to find a quiet place. Um, life is very busy in the villages. Trying to get, you know, recordings that have really good sound fidelity was difficult. You know, the sewage truck would come, the water truck would come. Uh, all the grandchildren would be in the house yelling. Um, trying to find a quiet spot was usually very difficult. And you know, trying to do the perfect uh, quiet interview was just not possible. We, we did the best we could. But I also think they're wonderful recordings to look, listen back to maybe in 50 years because you're going to hear what actually went on in households um, and uh, the, the daily, you know, the airplanes coming in, but the snowmobiles going by. And it's just, you know, what village life was. Also, too, there's, you know, when you're in a small community, if someone passes away, you know, everything shuts down for a couple of weeks. Everybody's related to everyone. Um, all of a sudden the fish start to, you know, to come in. So everybody's going to go to fish camp. Nobody wants to do an interview when everybody's going to be at fish camp. So you have to live with the, you know, the, the rhythms of the time. You can't just go into a community and say, here I am for the week. I'm going to do this in a week. It, it, it's not going to be feasible. You have to live with the rhythms of your community. And um, I would, that's why it took so long to get as many interviews done as we did. Yeah. Uh, please, could you provide us uh, some more insight into your oral history methodology? Uh, you know, converting orality into written text, into text, you know. 
Yeah, before I do that, I did see that Lisa Andre is on and, and submitted a question. Hi, Lisa, nice to see you. Um, yes, all the recordings have been digitized. Um, Sharon, do you quickly want to say about things now that have been archival down in Yellowknife before I go on to oral history methodology? Um, the the Gooch and Social and Cultural Institute is now the Department of Cultural and Heritage, and it's a it's a department under the Gutchen uh, Tribal Council. Um, for all our projects that were that happened under the Gutchen Social and Cultural Institute from 1993 to 2016, uh, because we don't have a place um, to store our material, we donated all our materials to the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center in the Northwest Territories. That's for safekeeping. And um, like in the future, if we, um, if we get a building, we would like to um, take our materials back. But until then, uh, the Prince of Wales are going to hold it and they're going to be accessible to the public. And that's one of the things that the elders would like is um, <clears throat> They always wanted to share their materials. Um, regarding oral history methodology, if you want to send me an email, I can send you a number of books um, that are, you know, that I like to use. I like to, um, Patricia Levy's book that I mentioned, then Abrams, Valerie Yells. There is a lot of material on oral history methodology um, well beyond this, the scope of this chat. So if you send me an email or and want to have a, a call with me, I'm more than happy to speak to you with you about um, that. Yes, um, we'll be in touch with you and hopefully we can have one more session. Um, you know, we can take one more last question if somebody would like to unmute. Um, you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Just two more minutes and then be able to uh, say it till we meet again later. Would anybody else be interested in posing your question directly? You are welcome to unmute yourself. I do see someone here who's asked um, how their experience looked. How's the journey experience along the journey changed your perspective? Um, it's, it changed every time you do a project. It changes your your thinking and perspective. It only enriches your life. I'm so honored, absolutely honored, to have been um, asked to do this work, and that the elders were so kind and giving with their time to me and everyone else on the project. Um, it made me really learn patience uh, with myself, especially um, because I like to get things done and move on. And 22 years to carry on a project really tested my patience. Um, but I'm so glad that it did because the end product is wonderful. Um, Sharon also has spent many years of her life on this project. <laughs> Sharon, has it changed your perspective? Um, <clears throat> I enjoyed working on the, um, the project. Many Christmas while I'm supposed to be on holidays, I'm working on the project. So, um, um, and the end product is what, what the result of the end product, I think is, is what um, I'm most proud of, that we were able to publish it, even though it was many years later. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sharon uh, and Ms. Leslie. We can listen to you for hours and hours. Uh, uh, however, I'm going to invite you all to, um, you know, share more, uh, you know, more insights. Uh, there are so many different insights, you know, because this orality from spoken to written is so interesting. Um, um, write more details about the transcription process. Uh, your presentation was excellent. Yeah. And uh, in plain screen, we do not say bye because we want to meet you again. We say later till we meet again. Moistas. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having